we we simulate that through sports. We simulate yeah. that through console wars. Yeah. We simulate that through <laughs> console wars. Uh, Marvel Online versus arguments. DC yeah, and yeah. like stupid stuff like that. <laughs> but it, it's literally that important to people. They're like right. that emotionally yeah, yeah. invested that in their team. winning yeah. their team winning against yeah. the rival. Welcome back to the State of the Arc podcast. My name is Mike. My name is Kason. And if this is your first time seeing our channel because you saw, hey, people are talking about Nier Automata. I'm going to click on that. Um, you probably, uh, well, we should probably introduce what we do here. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a storytelling analysis podcast series focused on games. So we talk yeah. about video game stories, but um, strictly the storytelling sort of aspects of it. Now, when when I say that, I mean mostly like techniques, um, literary, you know, qualities, yeah. symbolism mm -hmm. is a big thing that Kaysen will do quite often. Yeah. Um, philosophy, we, philosophy, we dig into the psychology. philosophy, psychology yeah. behind. Allegory. Yeah that, yeah, that sort of thing. It is not a lore podcast or like an exercise of... Uh, exhaustively summarizing every single thing that you can or can't do in the game. And we rarely talk about game mechanics, though it will come up sometimes if, um, if it lends to telling the story somehow. Or right, which this game does. It does. This, that, it, they will come yeah. up in this game quite a bit. Um, we did do a series already on Near Replicant and Gestalt. Yeah, we did. So um, that's on the channel if you want to go check that out. But you don't have to have played near replicant or gestalt to understand near automata you can yeah. just play this game we've had some people in our chat actually suggest that it might be better to have played automata first and then go back i don't mm. think that that's a bad idea it's kind of the way that i did it so in any case um that's kind of what we do here we also run it a little bit like a book club so the idea is that we will play up to certain sections as an assignment for the week. Yes. And then everyone returns and we kind of talk about what we played that week. So for Nier Automata, the way we're going to try to break this up is um, we, we're going to ask that you play all the way through ending A for next week. So there's different endings, by the way. There's a lot of endings in the game. Yeah. There's really only five serious, like, for real ones. And then there's tons of joke endings. But there's five innings, A, B, C, D, and E, that are going to be like the main ones we're focusing on. Um, and without spoiling this, because that's another thing we try not to do, we try not to talk about end game events or things that happen later in the story until we actually encounter them in our playthrough. Because a lot of people who join us are playing the game for the first time. Even for really old games that have been out for 20, 30 years, there are always people who are playing it for the first time. So we're trying to be yeah. sensitive to that and not, you know, spoil uh, things for people. So in the attempt to not spoil um, certain things, uh, we will be playing up through ending A. Um, and that's where we'll ask you guys to play up to. But we'll probably do more than one episode on the content found within that portion of the game. So um, we'll probably get at least two episodes, if not three out of that. So, okay. but that's where we're just going to say, hey, play up to this point, And then we're going to discuss everything within that over the next couple episodes we do. We're, again, we're not going to actually cover everything that's in ending A. So like, no. even if you don't quite finish it and you come, you'll probably be fine. Yeah. But the idea is, you know, we're going to be talking about the things that happen within ending A over the first next, you know, next, next yeah. couple episodes. Because another thing we do is our first episode is always on development history. Yeah. So our, I guess, philosophy behind this is before we like really dive into something and try to understand it, we want to, the best of our ability, understand the intentions of the creators yeah. and what their mindset was when they were making the game and get the kind of the best idea we can of what their goals were and, and use that to sort of temper expectations and talk within the realms of what's like necessary right. really to talk about. Um, that being said, that's not easy to do no. because, well, for this game, Especially because this game. Yoko Taro doesn't like to do that. He yeah. likes to deflect and evade questions in interviews because he wants the player to yeah. sort of like come up with their own ideas and think about it themselves. And he doesn't want to guide them or, you know, give them an idea of how they should think about it. Yeah. Which I, I can respect. Yeah, for sure. Um, but that being said, there is a ton of material to get through. 
Mm -hmm. um, so much so that I was, as I was sifting through all these articles and all of these interviews, I was like, where do we even start <laughs> in talking about this? It's such a, like a, it's such a stark difference between <laughs> we, uh, we, we covered <laughs> quest 64 right. a couple weeks ago and there's almost no information Remember about the dev history of that game. Yes. Uh, and now it's just, I mean, ton, I have so Tons. many tabs open. And so what I'm thinking we'll probably do for this is mostly just focus on the dev history that is concerned with theme story that sort of stuff and not so much like the game design aspects of it because if we were to do that it would be a super long yeah, yeah. episode and we, we try no, to keep these sense. about an hour and a half so that's kind of going to be today's episode is talking about how the game got into development how the project started and what the developers the, the kind of story they wanted to tell with it and some of their thoughts behind that while also just talking about Yoko Taro a bit more as a creator yeah. he's, he's just a super interesting person he is he is okay um anything else that i missed before we no take off here in. let's do it so the story behind near automata's development actually starts with takahisa taura so he was a young developer at platinum games and he was a big fan of the right. first near he, he just loved the game. He would sit there and write his own kind of fan fiction, so to speak, <laughs> about where he thinks it could go next. Well, I had heard this. The game developers loved that game. Yes. And it, the game, so, you know, near Replicant and near Gestalt, Gestalt yeah. uh, didn't sell super well. No. Um, it sold well enough to where it's like, okay, you know, they didn't there, fire Yoko Taro. Or yeah, anything. there's a, a fan but, base for it, a yes. passionate fan base, but it's small. But it did not sell as well as they were hoping that it would, right? Um, but what these near games do so well is they incorporate different types of gameplay into the mechanics of the game. Mm -hmm. And that's really appealing for other game devs where it's like, oh my gosh, you created like a bullet hell thing mixed with like a side scrolling mixed with, you know, and you, you, um, Yoko Taro was able to make a game that incorporated all these different types of gameplay yep. into just this one game. Yep. And so game developers really like the game, mm -hmm. but a lot of other people never even heard of it. Right. Right. So the, but the developers were stoked about it and yep. that's really important for this. Yeah. So he was a big fan, this, uh, Takahisa Taura. And, um, so it's important to note here, uh, and, and I'm not going to try to go over too much of what we already covered in the near replicant and Gestalt podcast right. in terms of its development. <clears throat> yeah. But that game was developed by a company called Cavia and Cavia was in, uh, they had a, a contract with Square Enix who published it. So this mm -hmm. game is, yeah. it'll have Square Enix on the box art or whatever, but these, these near games are not developed by uh, no. internal Square Enix They're studios. developed third party, yeah. Right. Um, so oh. they're, they just published them. Um, and so Cavia was the developer of the first near, but that company is defunct now. And mm -hmm. uh, Yoko Taro kind of left Cavia and, and was doing freelance, like his Basically own stuff. Yeah. After, after near released, I'm pretty sure he was mostly working on mobile titles, mm. like the kind of small mobile. <laughs> There's some funny things he says in here about where he was thinking about doing with near post yeah. the original game about it being a mobile title and all this weird stuff. But, um, now the other interesting thing is that there is a mobile near title now that no. Square Enix uh, post automata yeah. that well, I haven't played yet. After automata, they realized that this near thing can yeah, become a franchise <laughs> and can become good, big business, you know, good money. Yeah, exactly. So they've done all sorts of things with it now, but that was not the case at this time. So Square Enix really had no plans to do anything with near after mm. the release of the original game, though the yeah. producer and of course, director Yoko Taro, producer, uh, his name is Yasuke Saito. No, Yosuke Saito, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They both wanted to. Yeah. Um, but there were other people internally at Square who just didn't feel like it was worth it, didn't feel like the sales yeah. were high enough on the original game to merit doing anything with that. So it kind of sat on the shelf for years. It did, but he was able to do a, a Dragon Guard game after yeah. that. Dragon Guard 3. Dragon Guard 3, three yeah. Right, which is like, I don't know, probably a lower budget than yeah. what Nier was, but yeah. you know, it, it ended up being a pretty good game. Yeah. And so um, Square Enix was just looking for a collaboration project. They were going out to different studios mm -hmm. and sort of just talking to people. They came to Platinum Games, who happened to also kind of be on a little bit of a 
downward slope. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, of course, they're they're they were famous for developing uh, Bayonetta. Yeah. Uh, what is it? I think it's Wonderful One Hundred One, which was a yes. Wii U exclusive game. Um, they did a Metal um, Gear game. Um, Metal Gear, Metal Gear. Uh, the one with Raiden. Um, Re, 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 revengeance re, or re yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah, resurgence. Yeah, <laughs> resurgence, some, some revengeance. Like, yeah. uh, rising. No, it was a. Ri- it's rising. It's oh, rising. That's it. Metal it was Gear originally. Uh, the reason I'm thinking that because I think its original title was supposed to be re, re, sur- re <laughs> something revengeance something. It was a really weird title, and then they changed it to Rising, which was easier to remember. Oh, but the, yeah, they developed that game, which is a fun game too. Um, uh, I don't know if we'll ever cover that on the podcast, despite the fact that we do cover Metal Gear games. But yeah, story wise, it's just freaking <laughs> insane. <laughs> I but. have heard. I have heard. <laughs> Anyways. <clears throat> They were on a little bit uh, of a downward slope business-wise. Yeah. I, I think the quality of their games is un- indisputable. They, they make great stuff. Yeah, Particularly well polished, action. Fast-paced. Yeah. yeah, really well-polished character action games, um, which, you know, they're not typically my cup of tea gameplay-wise, right. but, it, you know, that kind of is what it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're very good. There's, there's no disputing the quality. But they were struggling a little bit, too. So you have Nier, which is kind of in this... As a, as an IP is kind of in this uh, this uh, limbo yeah. stage where they don't really know what to do with it. You have Platinum, who's kind of looking to to turn things around as a business, and then Square Enix comes knocking on the door, saying, "Hey, we want to do a collaboration with you." And then this uh, Taura Taka, Takehisa Taura, who's a huge fan mm. of the original Nier, hey, we want to make Nier. Can we do that? Well, I guess so. Like, <laughs> if you guys want to make it, like. <laughs> We're not doing anything with that, but if that's if that's what you want to work on, like let's go for it. Mm. So that's how it got started, um, and it was a nice fit because most of the criticism of the original Near was on its mechanics and gameplay. Yeah, yes, yes. not that's on its true. story and music. People love the story and the music. Yeah, and the characters. I think specifically what Saito brings up here, it was that it was the the combat and it was the character designs that they felt like needed to be polished or, or go in yeah. a little bit different direction. And so with Platinum Games, that's like exactly the right partner to do gameplay yeah. of the style that they were thinking about. Of course, this isn't like a straight up character action game in the way that Bayonetta is or something like that or Devil May Cry. Yeah. It, it's an RPG. So there was some learning curves there for Platinum too that were, they were developing an RPG for the first time. So yeah. p- kind of bringing their blend of action into an RPG game, which was a little bit of a challenge, but that's what Yoko Taro was there for, who had worked almost exclusively on, uh, well, not, well, his mobile titles, not so much, but on console, he had basically worked on RPGs. He had worked yeah. on Drakengard and, and yeah. Nier. So it was kind of like just like the right partnership at the right time for both parties, which is kind of cool. Um, so we have... Uh, some quotes here that I wanted to read from Taro and Saito about the, the idea of doing a sequel, right? Uh, so Taro said in this interview here, Square Enix came to me and said, well, it didn't sell very well being the first name. Right. Sorry, we can't make another one. <laughs> Saito says it was in the red. So uh, it, this is interesting because there's a little bit of a contradiction because in another article, Yoko Taro said it wasn't in the red. It didn't lose money. It oh. just didn't make enough money to merit a sequel. Okay. But Saito, the producer, is saying it was in the red. Hmm. So I don't know which is true, but in either case, it just didn't sell that well. Right. Um, it didn't make money, but there were still a lot of hardcore fans that really liked the game, the world, and everything that was in there. In the previous title, we did receive high praises for storyline, the music, and the characters. Especially for the previous title, you could experience the game in full with multiple endings if you play multiple times. We did receive a lot of feedback saying that it was a really touching game. The players uh, really uh, cried when playing the game. However, we did also receive feedback saying that the action part of the game wasn't as great. And so we did think that it was somewhere that we needed to improve on. Uh, We received high praises for the storyline, but for those that really did not play through the entire game until the fourth ending. Okay, so I don't want to say too much there in case spoiling a different game, but Nier and Drakengard... They're mm-hmm. they're structured in the same way where it's like yeah, yeah. if you come to the editing credits you have not finished the game just yes. know that like <laughs> yeah. you didn't beat the game the first time you see credits you're gonna you're gonna have to play the game multiple times 
and unlock different endings. These are not trivial differences in the endings. The endings are like all important to telling the overall story. So whether you're playing near or dragon guard, like that's something you should know. So, yeah. um, as we play through this game, like we're saying for the first, you know, section we're telling you to play up through play through ending a, that's like just the beginning of the game. Really, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's so way more stuff after that. Uh, I remember when I played automata for the first time, yeah. I was, I came to the credits. I was like, well, that was a short game. Like, <laughs> what, I what remember is, that, what's actually. going on here? Yeah. Like, yeah. is that really the end? There's no way that's the end. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, you're supposed to play yeah. again. Uh, anyway, so but, but we'll it, get into that. For anybody who hasn't played it yet, it's not exactly like just playing the exact game again. Um, there, there are always differences. Some of the characters will tell you different things. Um, and there's newer places to go to. It's not exactly just playing the exact game over again. Yes. Um, there's, there's a lot of differences. There's differences. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, that's a good point. I, I'm glad you brought yeah. that up. You don't just gonna, in, in the original near, it was that. Yeah. You did just play the whole game again. <laughs> the exact same areas. <laughs> right, and everything. Yeah. This time they, they tried to mix it up a little bit more where it's like your second playthrough is really different than the first and you learn different things. Mm. So, um, yeah, just keep in mind, you're not yeah. going to be playing exactly the same game like five times. Um, it, it, they, they do more with it than that. This And time. it says a different ending, but it's not just the ending. No, it's like a lot of, a lot of stuff changes Yeah, so. for sure. So Saito goes on to say the timing was amazing. Miraculous. This collaboration was suggested when we just come up with the idea of making the near sequel, a mobile game. So they were one of the ideas that yes. was floating around there. Was, was a mobile game. To make it mobile. And then as they kind of developed the idea more, they were like, hey, maybe this isn't going to be mobile. They they threw on the idea of a PS Vita. Yeah. And they're like, maybe we can make a PS Vita game. And eventually they just settled on, like, let's just do a full console game yep. again mm -hmm. um, and see if we can get the uh, what the funding people to, to bite. Say yes. <laughs> um, because I think their ambition was a little too high for, for just a mobile game. Yeah. Uh, so he says we were inspired by Platinum Games. They were great fans of the first Nier, and their suggestion was to remake Nier as a Vita title. Mm. So we got two Which different happen, projects right? together. Something like that happened. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Is there a remake of the first Nier? I don't uh, think there maybe is. Maybe I'm thinking about something else. Um, anyway, hmm. uh, there are well, two the different first projects Nier together. got a recent remake, but yes, I don't know if it was the, for the, the Vita. The remastered version, yeah. which makes it feel more in line with Platinum's style for Automata in terms mm. of combat. Combat is is a lot better in the remastered yes. near replicant than yeah. in the original. But uh, so we got two different projects together, and maybe the best option was doing a full console game. Um, the the person who wrote the article here uh, says near two is a mobile game. Taro says the original idea was along the lines of Farmville, something that surely would have gone down just swimmingly with the fans. So he was like, a, have you ever seen Farmville? I don't before? think I have. <laughs> and I thought that was a joke when I read that. In yeah. my, I read that line in my research, and I was like, really? Well, that's the thing that you can never tell with Taro. You, I you, know. It's hard to tell sometimes when he's being serious and when he's just being a, a he absurd. He does this for, on purpose, just to be funny, because he wears. That mask and it's yeah. like you don't get any facial cues. You don't know yeah. if he's smiling or not. <laughs> you just accept what he says. The interview I listened to was so funny. He was talking about one of the other people we're going to be talking about soon. One of the other people that he works on the game with, and he says, "Oh, this guy's awesome. He's really good with girls." I always got the feeling that he was fooling around with the voice actresses behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> is that an accusation? Is that real? <laughs> or was he just messing with this guy? You, we'll never know. We will never know. Yeah. He's so funny. He he would rather not do interviews, but because yeah, the yeah. producers make him do it to promote the game, he kind of plays right. with people a little yeah. bit. And so it's like he's, he, he's funny, he feels but. uncomfortable, so he's going to make you feel uncomfortable <laughs> too. Uh. But anyways, Farmville is a game that like my mom plays. Yeah, so. well, I think that my mom or my wife plays this game. Yeah, I, I think I think it's because um, it's linked to your Facebook account. Somehow. That's right, it's Facebook. And so you gain yeah, yeah. anyways. There's a whole sharing aspect with that. And anyway, so if 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 this is legit, if they, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll which never is know. The, th the thing that the reason it's hard to know is because I could see Yoko Taro sure. saying, "Let's do." Let's do a Farmville. Farmville near game. Yeah. Because he wanted Dragon Guard 2 to be like in space. And oh, remember yeah. like how crazy his that's idea right. was for what Dragon Guard 2 should yeah. be. And everyone's like, shut up. That's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're definitely not doing that. <laughs> right. So like I could see that being legit. I could also, I could also see him just messing with people by saying that so that they could get a rise out of people. I don't know. But apparently something along the lines of Farmville 
mobile title, but with the near IP was like in the works or was there was being talked about uh-huh. at least for a certain period of time. Maybe someone should and, do something. And like Saito that. says, "Yeah, we're very glad we didn't go that route." So if Saito's saying it, then that's got to be true, right? He's not. Know, he's dude. not messing around. <laughs> <laughs> I don't freaking know. Anyway, it's just funny. So yeah. Um, let's see. My next note here is. Um, I think we've kind of already covered this, but I want to go through the the, the quotes. Uh, some people may be wondering, should I play the first Nier in order to understand this? Yeah. Um, the answer is no. Nope. You do not need to do that. Um, for the same reason that Drakengard was tied into Nier, they're, they're like... Yeah. They're like... Technic- canonically, con- technically connected. Yeah, yeah. Um, not necessarily a sequel per se, but their worlds are connected. But yeah. you don't have to have played Dragon Guard mm-hmm. to play near, right? No. At all. Um, and and the same is true here. Even though they are even more closely connected, they're at least within the same world rather than the same universe. But Taro says in response to anyone wondering that, in terms of the story, they're not actually all that connected. The world is shared. But we really went and made this game uh, so that you can enjoy without having played the previous Nier title. And Mm. the reason that they did that, Saito kind of goes over here. Um, He says, I don't consider the previous title to be a huge success. But at the same time, there are a lot of people who really loved that title. Because it was a title that was loved by many people, I wanted to expand that to more people, like more to more players, right? We wanted to share that world with more people. If we made this new title a direct sequel, you have to play the previous title, then that opportunity gets tiny. Yeah. It just doesn't reach as many people as we want it to reach. That's why we decided to make the main story of the game something that you don't have to play the previous title to enjoy, which is really smart. Yeah, very smart. If you you want to get both worlds. Yeah, if you want to continue an IP, but it's like mm. the first one almost nobody played and we're looking for a bigger audience, then yeah. you can't tie it too much because then it, it's reliant on mm-hmm. them having played this. And yeah. So that's kind of the reason why they went the direction they did. So near Automata's story takes place about 10,000 years yeah. in the future <laughs> Way of near story, yeah. which itself was many thousands of years in the future <laughs> of our world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, or so, Dragon Guard or any of that. Yeah, yeah so this is way like, in the we're talking about way in the future, right? Yeah. So... A lot of kind of science fiction ideas to kind of play with there that are that are pretty cool, but yeah. Um, they they also touched on character design, feeling like they needed to change that. Um, so the character designer on Nier Automata is Akihiko Yoshida, yeah, who, who is a Final Fantasy yeah. character designer for Twelve and Final Fantasy Fourteen and Tactics, Tactics. Yeah, that group because yeah. he worked on Tactics Ogre, yeah, um, and the games you know that he came over with that team when yeah. they came over to do Tactics to, to Square, yeah. and he stayed with Square Enix for a long time. Yeah, and uh, I, I actually I don't think this is true. I don't think he did the character designs for Sixteen, which is coming out. He did not do it for no. that game, but he did do it on Fourteen, which that team That's right, is yeah, now 14. making Sixteen. But I love Akihiko mm. Yoshida. He also Vagrant Story was another guy. That's he right. Did the Vagrant character story. design for us. Yeah, I love very his design. Good. Very good. So he did the character designs for Near Automata. Mm. Um, so Saito says uh, it's been about five years since the last game, and based on a lot of the fan feedback we received, we really wanted to make another game of the IP. There were a lot of points we wanted to address where we felt we could have done better. Taking all that feedback and the things we learned from the previous game, we thought the character design was something that we could work on. So we reached out to Akihiko Yoshida, who is a fa- uh, famous, obviously, for Final Fantasy XII, and oh, Bravely Default is another oh, game. Oh, Bravely he does. Default, yeah. That's and we approached him with the thought that he might turn us down, but fortunately, he said, "Yes, let's do this." So um, he's actually not a Square Enix employee. It's just actually true of a lot of people who work with Square Enix; they're contractors. So, oh, like, Yoko yeah. Taro has yeah. never been an employee of Square Enix. Mm. Um, Akiko Shida was never an employee of Square right. Enix. Uh, for a while, Nobuo Uematsu left and was just yeah. contracting. Um, same with, uh, I always forget his name, the the writer-director for Final Fantasy XII and Tactics and Vagrant Story. Oh, yes. Matsu, Matsuno. Be, yeah, Hideki. Matsuno. Uh, yeah, yeah. Matsuno. Matsuno. He, he has yeah. come back in, in that role of a contractor for Final Fantasy XIV mm. expansions. So there's a lot of people who do work at Square that don't necessarily work for Square. Yeah. And uh, Yoshida is one of them. And Taro is one of them. Um, so anyways, um, I, I don't think I took the note here, 
But Taro had originally wanted to bring back the character designer for the original Nier, but he had he broke injured his, his arm. Hand, his yeah, arm or hand. It's like yeah. his elbow, yeah. Yeah. And so he suggested this other Yeah, artist. going yeah. to Yoshida instead. So Taro had wanted to involve him, but yeah. he couldn't do it because uh, of an injury. So that's the reason why they didn't bring him back. Not just because they didn't like his work. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so that more or less covers like how the project got started mm. and from here like i said th there's so many things we could talk about um but i think it's probably best that we just focus on the uh, the elements that we actually break down in the podcast which are not game design related right. typically or you know combat related or anything like that so i want to talk more about the sort of thematic and philosophical content okay. of near automata yeah, no, and lot. what people can <laughs> expect because there's actually some outside material that I am reading for this, which okay. I haven't done since the Xenogears podcast. Oh, nice. Cool. Um, where, you know, we read Carl Jung and we read um, yeah. Freud and we read some the other... Nag Hammadi. Yeah, yeah the <laughs> Nag Hammadi Library, yeah. uh, the Gnostic Gospels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, since Xenogears, I have not gone that deep into reading outside material since then. Okay. I, I'll usually glaze it. Or like get the just to be familiar. Yeah, yeah, get like the gist of it from somebody's YouTube video or whatever, just so I know mostly what I need to know. Mm. But this time, I am feeling the need to actually like read some of the philosophers oh, that good. are referenced in the game directly. Good. Um, one of, uh, in a similar way to Xenogears. Um, characters are named after, yeah, f you know, famous philosophers yep. in this game. Um, like uh, the, for, the other Neo Blas Pascal is, Pascal is a big one. Yeah, um, and, and some Jean, others that I'll Jean get Paul, into. Jean Paul, yeah, yeah. Sartre. Sartre. Yeah. Sartre. I don't know how to Sartre. pronounce. It's Sartre. It's, I don't know how to pronounce. <laughs> yes, but in English, <laughs> they just say Sartre. But I don't know. Whatever. Yeah, how to pronounce these? It, it's all three of them of the major yeah. ones are all French. Yeah, uh, yeah. philosophers. Um, two of them more contemporary. De Beauvoir. Yeah, De Beauvoir. Yeah. Uh, she and Sartre are, yeah. Sartre <laughs> are both from the same... They, they actually were friends and oh, cool. companions for a while. <laughs> maybe even intimately, you know, uh, had an intimate relationship. Hmm. Um, so the two of them were from the same time period, but um, Pascal was from like the 1700s or 1600s, yeah. I think, even no, before, before that. that. that makes yeah, sense, yeah. So a lot further before. But those are three in particular that have like characters named after them in the game. Hmm. So anyway, um, I have some material that I, I want to kind of go over as like an introduction to some of that. But let's let's get into like what, what people can expect as far okay. as what this story is like really about, right? Like yeah. what they're really going for. So... Um, here is an interview of Taro and Saito. Uh, the interviewer asks, the Nier series has always had a lot of strong themes and very deep backstory. Where will this one go in terms of that? Now, I wanted to bring this one up first because this is something Taro always deflects or dismisses yeah. in interviews. Yeah. He never wants to talk about this. Right. Ever. Like, and, and it's really interesting, his reasons for why. And there's part of me that feels like, he contradicts or conflicts his own reasons in one way, but in another way, one, yeah. I totally get it why yeah. he does this. But th here's his answer. I'll let him speak for himself first. He says, for me, I don't really give it a whole lot of deep thought when coming up with themes. There's not really this deep theme for me personally. If the fans have read into it and attached uh, certain themes or think that there's a certain theme to it, I think that's great. But for me, I don't go into it with anything pre-planned. I don't give a whole lot of deep thought. It's sort of on a whim or in the moment. I, um, I, I don't believe that. It's hard to believe that's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I think I know why he does this, though. Yes. Do you? Do you? I th I, I'll let okay. you go, but I think I, think I do, too. Okay. I, I'm pretty sure I know why he does this. Um, but I don't want to... Speak Before too much. Before him or... No, but I don't want to speak too much as to, like, maybe the ending of the game. Sure. Try to avoid spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> but let's just say that, um, I don't know, like, there's a lot of Nietzsche yeah. in this, right? There's a lot of Camus. There's a lot of Sartre. There's a lot of the older, you know, philosophers who talk about the world and whether or not the world intrinsically has some meaning that is there yes. to be discovered. Yes. Essentialism versus existentialism. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
And basically, he is presenting a story that has no meaning other than the meaning that you give it. Right. Because he feels like the world and life is yes. presented as a meaningless thing that only has meaning once you give it meaning. Right. And I think a lot of this game is speaking to that idea. Yes. And he's, I think he, he would feel like he's contradicting himself to say, oh, this is what the game means. Here's the theme of the game. This yes. is what I was trying right. to say. Right. Because he, as the artist, as the creator, as the god of Near Automata, he is trying to tell you something that, <laughs> like he's he's rejecting the role yeah. of him being the know-all be-all creator of this world despite that that's what he is yes and that that's why i kind of don't believe him yes <laughs> right but he's trying to step away and say no like someone had to make it but my point is is that even if no one made it it still has meaning to you yes. and i think that's that's powerful it's interesting um and it's a lot of what this game's about yes kind of at the core yes i think that's a very good way to put it and there's also the point, he could have just said that, <laughs> right? No, but, Rather but, than saying, I didn't give it I, any thought, really. <laughs> I know, I, uh, but, but once you say that, yeah, you, you, I, I do agree. He, I, he couldn't with, say it, yes, right? He yes. means it, but as soon as you come out and say it, then you've, in essence, de facto pr uh, prescribed a, a theme of, yes. of what nihilism, existentialism, you've, you've applied that theme to the game. And now people say, oh, that's the theme. But it's like, no. So he can't say it. We <laughs> right. can say it. Right. He can't say it. Yes. It would ruin his whole experiment yes. that he's trying to I, do. I think, I think you're on to something with yeah. that. Um, so it, my thought as I read his responses is there's no way you didn't give any deep thought dude to he the near sure games he for sure there's did. just no way at the same <laughs> yeah. time i also acknowledge that sometimes because because there are some writers who sort of they 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 don't necessarily do a lot of um you know like pre-planning or or uh what's the word i'm looking for we block out the whole thing oh like storyboard or not storyboarding it's, it's outline outline yeah. yeah thank you i don't know why i couldn't think of that word <laughs> There are some writers, George R. R. Martin is kind of famous for this, who they don't like to outline. Mm. They feel like it limits them. They're kind of more like, what am I feeling right they now? Feel what's, it, what's, yeah. what's flowing through me? I'm that way a little bit too in my mm. own writing. I have a hard time uh, sitting down to outline. Yeah. Like, like I find it difficult to lock in and build an outline. I almost mm. never actually complete one. I'll start them and I want to mm. have an idea of where I'm going. I want to know where I'm going before I get there because I'm all about writing for theme. I'm all about thinking about the theme first. But some people aren't. And there's no right way to write a story. It's just, you know, you, you do what works for you. And so, so, so some people really right. are that way. And yeah. it, it, they're sort of accidentally, you know, uh, almost like intuitively or, or subconsciously there's something that's important to them. There's sure. a theme. They're just not thinking of it in those terms. They're not thinking about what's my theme, but anytime but you write a story a that actually resonates yeah. with people, there's a theme there. Even if you didn't like intend to put it in, yes. you kind of did subconsciously. That's right? kind of a theme of this podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Is what you just said, right. that whether it was intentional or not, the theme is there. And this game has so much brilliant like philosophical and thematic content that it, it's 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 preposterous to think that uh, that it, it is only accidentally there yes that it was not intentionally put there right um but at the same time yeah that doesn't mean that he planned it out and was like oh i want people to think this like that's yeah. you know clearly not what he was trying to do right um yeah yeah so i could i don't know i i i, I still find it hard to believe <laughs> I find it very hard to believe that he didn't at least have in mind some of the concepts you're talking about. Yeah. Um, especially since uh, he, some of these philosophers are directly referenced exactly. as characters. And the characters. There's no way that's, oh, that was just an accident. Like, I, I, yes. I didn't mean to do that. Ooh, whoops. Like, I didn't mean to name him Pascal after Blas Pascal. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> that I just, I just don't think that's possible. Right. But. I, don't, I don't. I don't think so either. But I do respect what he's trying to do here, and he's in a, in in a in a sense he's trying to stay in character. Yes. Right. And and in and which is clearly what he he's wears that big helmet. Like yeah. he's clearly trying to stay in character. He's trying to be a, a character. He's put, he's presenting us a little bit of a a persona, right? And it's obvious. It's like, hey, that's not who you really are. You're wearing this big helmet. You're yeah. telling me that you didn't give any thought to this masterpiece <laughs> philosophical game that you made. But like at the same time, it's like I can respect it though because it's he's crafting a world, right? 
um, while trying to assert that maybe there is no crafter of the world. And, um, you know, you, that's a hard thing to do, but the way he's doing it is like, I would say is like a decent way to do it. Sure. Um, you know what's really funny? So you you I watched him in this one interview. I watched him take off that helmet. Yeah. Right? right. Now I think you can find older pictures of him before he had the helmet, and around 2009 or so, he never appeared without the helmet yep. for a very long time. And then all of a sudden, um, he took his he took the helmet off, and he just looks like a normal dude. It's like pretty normal. Pretty. I was guessing as to why he felt the need to wear that all the time, and I was incorrect. Like. He's a good looking dude. Like he's a regular looking <laughs> dude. Like there's nothing there that he's trying to hide. I think that it just helps him to perform this character yes. that, that he's being. And and it's not it's not to say that he's lying or that he's being disingenuous. It's just that I think even as he's making these games, he is he is being a character as mm. well. Right? Like he's decided that he is just going to like embrace this role of this character and he will even be this character in interviews and all that. He almost never takes off that helmet. Um, but I personally respect it. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and, and he does, I think I have a quote here. If I don't get to it later, then I'll, I'll kind of just briefly go over it now. Okay. Um, his, his, his reason, and it, it sounds, it, it, it sounds absurd to the point of being like obviously contradictory. Yeah. But I think I got it the more I thought about it. Yeah. His, his, reason stated reason at least one of them is that he doesn't want to distract from the game by sure. being that sort of auteur uh developer who like mm. is the face of the franchise say like Hironobu Sakaguchi was for Final Fantasy sure or you know like there are other very outspoken sort of like lead developer creators of series where it's like you attach that guy hmm. to the thing and so, like, when they appear, they almost have become this celebrity or yeah. something like that, right? Where, and, and people latch on to what they say about the game and use that to sort of craft their own thoughts about it. So he says he doesn't want to be that. Right. But the second you put but. on that mask, <laughs> it's almost immediately you're distracting from the game. That's all anyone can think about, about right. right? Where it's like, oh, Yoko Taro, oh, oh, the guy who made Nier. Oh, that crazy guy who wears the helmet all the time. Yes. Like you associate that with him. Yes. However, the way he did it was by picking a uh, the character design of a character in from Nier. in the world. Right. In so, so it is kind of circular, yeah. right? So he's got the game and then the creator. And he's, he's trying to distract. He's trying to... Uh, distract you, reflect, I guess, yes. from when you look at the creator of the game and then you're looking back at the game itself. The helmet because acts he's as, wearing a, as the a reflect accessory. It's yes. a, you cast magic and it bounces it back to the end. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> That's perfect. If they try to tell me the theme, boom, you Ooh. tell me the theme. <laughs> and he's like, the theme is the game. And then he's wearing the character helmet and it's like, yeah, I, I look at that character helmet <clears throat> and I just think of the character in Nier, right? Yeah. I don't actually think Yoko Taro necessarily. I think Emil yeah. or something like that. Yeah, and on top of that, uh, uh, while the the caricature, I guess, of Yoko Taro does briefly distract from the game, it does. It really does. <laughs> he, when he talks about his games, yeah, he is evasive in yeah, such a way true. to where he will not give an answer that would plant the seed of what. Oh, this was the intention, and so therefore. Right. This is what you should think about when you play it. Therefore, he is doing his stated intention, which is allowing the thing to go out to the player and the player to kind of decide and think about it more deeply mm. for themselves. He doesn't want to begin the discussion about themes of the game. Yeah. He wants the players to do that, and he wants to stay out of it. And if they look at him, all they see is a reflection of the game yes. back at them. Right. And, and once again, their own interpretation of that game. Right. It's really genius. I think it's fascinating as well that we are basically analyzing the director of this game as though he is a character. Right. Right. We're trying to read into his lines. Right. We're sure. trying to figure out what the theme of him <laughs> is. Exactly what, what is he this character want saying? Us to do. <laughs> no, but we're trying to figure him out, you know, and he doesn't want to be figured out, but we're trying because we're, we're that's what we do. Yeah. Right. Um, but it's hilarious. I don't think we've ever analyzed a director uh, to the extent that we have Yoko Taro. Yeah. Um, and it's in part because he's so elusive. And so yeah. we really have to like, you know, work hard to figure him out. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about some other things here. So I just wanted to bring that up first that we're going to talk about themes. We're going to talk about a lot about philosophy, but, um, 
he doesn't really say much about it. So there's not much no. to draw from him, and that's on purpose. But there's clearly, clearly some outside sources that were inspirations for him. Yeah. And to what extent, I can't say because I'm not him, but they were. And so we're just going to have to find out what we can by reading them ourselves, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I got a quote here that says, it's been an interest of mind and an observation for a very long time while I've been making games. Most games are about defeating an enemy or killing an enemy and surviving through that. In some ways, it's also come to be seen as an enjoyable thing. This was kind of a big part of the first Nier's theme, yeah. was this idea that it, games create a, 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 a loop where you enjoy killing and how yeah. messed up he thought that was. Actually, this is even before Nier. This goes yeah. back to Dragonguard 1. Mm. Like, this, that was a huge whole thing about Kaim, the, the, that was the his dragon. name, right? The, the main character and the oh, dragon, yes, yeah, their yeah, relationship. Kaim. But, like, the main guy you play as mm -hmm. was this, like, psychopathic, freaking murderous killer, right? <laughs> and, like, anyway, so the, it goes all the way back to that. People have fun, and there's some fun to be had in destroying someone or killing someone. And I've always wondered about that. Why do people enjoy the act of killing, and why do they do it? And surely maybe that motivation and the reasoning is flawed and the reason people do these things, kill people, enjoy killing, is because they're missing something or there's definitely some kind of problem there. So that's going to make that's a resurgence. A, it's kind of a common okay. thing yeah. across all of his work. Mm -hmm. um, it may not necessarily be the main focus like it was in, say, Drakengard, but that is going to be there too. So right. just keep your eye on that concept, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the original Dragon Guard, for instance, humans give up a piece of their existence, their voice, their sight, or even their ability to die in order to make packs with myth mythical beasts. Yep. Kaim, the hero, Kaim is obsessed man. with revenge, slaying his enemies mercilessly. During combat, his comrades frequently comment on his worrying obsession and how much he enjoys the act of killing. The first near game also touches on the soul as humans try to... Uh, I, I won't go f there in order to not uh, okay. spoil that game. If there's one theme that maybe comes back again and again in all of the works that I make, it probably is that relationship of how people see and relate to killing. Mm. So that's kind of a common thing across all of his works. That yeah. may not be, again, at the forefront of this game, but it, it is something to think about. Now, cool. this next note I've put in red because I'm going to come back to this Good. after we've beaten the game. I'm not going to talk about this yet because it would be a spoiler. But I did put here at the very end in black a part I can say. Um, there's a line where the commander tells 9S that they needed a god worth dying for. Have you given the concept of god much thought, says mm, the interviewer. And uh, he says, it's not about god, but rather I often think about how you can find the reason to can't. live, or he can't find the reason to live if there's nothing that you can believe in. Mm. We currently find ourselves in the same situation in which our self is dependent on science, numbers, religion, politics, money, work, country, family, and those that we love. Just as androids blindly believed in humankind, I believe that we are also blind to what we believe in. Yeah. So this is touching on sort of the essentialism, existentialism thing that you were talking about. But that's, yeah. I guess, the vehicle or the lens through which we'll be viewing it here is... Uh, that's almost one of the first things they say in the game is, um, what is it? Uh, is it glory to mankind or something like that? It's, it's like the saying in of, of the androids. Like, it's like their battle cry, glory to mankind. So the thing that the, the, believing in humanity, their creators, right, um, is like a big, big part of like the lens through which he's going to be uh, viewing this concept hmm. of um, – it's not about God, but rather about we have we we can't function without right. a purpose. We can't yeah. function without something to, to believe in that like gives us a purpose to move forward. And you know how we go about sort of like you know yeah. creating that for ourselves, right? That just reminds me of Camus Camus' uh, famous line, which is probably relevant throughout a large chunk of this game: that the only true philosophical question is whether or not to kill yourself. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the only, that is, that is the only actual question in the world. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, if you, if you can't find a reason, then you can't live, right? Yeah. The only way you can live is if you have a purpose. I love this quote. So I'm going to pull it up real quick. The, the Albert Camus suicide absurdity. The literal meaning of life is whatever you're doing that prevents you from killing yourself. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's Albert Camus. <laughs> that's great. And you know, the more you think about it, it's like, like, like living. In one sense, you can just say, oh, it's a passive thing, right? Sure. That just to live is passive. But in another sense, it's like, no, it's active. You have to, yeah. to you, you, every moment of your life, you have to choose to continue living. Yes, right. right. And it's like, what makes you do that? Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. Very good stuff. So coming back to this interview, the machines in Automata are constantly talking about purpose and how a lack of purpose drives them insane. What drives you, I guess he says, and what gives you purpose? This is the same as the reply I've made above, he says. I'm also intrigued by the mysteriousness and poorly balanced nature of humans. Uh, the next question. Most games only define the motivations of the main characters, the good guys. You spend a lot of time defining the motivations of the villains, often to the point that you become sympathetic to their point of view, even if you disagree with their conclusions. How come? He says... This is because I believe that humans in the real world cannot make a move without any motivation. Right. I feel Can't that anything. Yeah, I feel that a world in which you only see what you want to see is incomplete. And as a game creator, I am only here to prepare a game that will expand the breadth of your thinking and leave the decision between good and evil up to the players. So this was That's also cool. something that he touched on uh, in interviews for the first near how he was inspired by the way people reacted to the 9-11 terrorist oh, yeah, attacks, and right? the invasion of Iraq. And, yeah. and the fact that he he's not American, he's Japanese. Right. So he's, you know, sort of outside of both cultures that were mm -hmm. at war with each other. And his perspective on that as somebody who's not integrated into either culture and, like, the way that they villainized the other and uh, the propaganda surrounding both cultures right, yeah. and, and kind of being outside of that and seeing how the, that affected the de people. Dehumanizing the enemy. And, yeah. You know, right. All that. And so I, I feel like that's kind of what he's touching on here too, you know, um, mm -hmm. wanting to expand the breadth of your thinking that, uh, I feel that in a, I feel that a world in which you only see what you want to is incomplete. And that, that yes. often happens to, because I, I think human beings are tribalistic just by nature. We, we, we evolved in such a way to where we sought out collaboration with the strongest team yeah, so that we could yeah. win and survive longer, right? So yeah. it's, it's, it's almost like hardwired into us to do this. Uh, even in a society today where it's not a matter of survival, whether your football team beats the rival football team. Yeah, it still <laughs> you, makes you feel, you know, <laughs> big feelings. I mean, I, mean, uh, I mean, really, really profoundly deep strong emotion yes, yes. attached to whether something you're not involved in at all yes. goes the way you want it to go yep. because of what it means to your identity to lose to that rival and the others, the, yeah. those people over there who are our enemies, right? This, we, 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 we almost simulate that what used to be war tribal yeah. battles yes. with, with rivaling, rivaling, tri rivaling tribes over territory and whatnot. Mm -hmm. We, we simulate that through sports. We simulate yeah. that through console wars. Yeah. We simulate that through <laughs> console wars. Uh, Marvel Online versus arguments. DC yeah, and yeah. like stupid stuff like that. <laughs> but it, it's literally that important to people. They're like right. that emotionally yeah, yeah. invested that attached in to their team. winning, yeah. their team winning against yeah. the rival. So I feel like there's a huge part of mm. human nature that evolved with the need to do this. Yes, yes, absolutely. And breaking that is really hard. It is. Because we seek a world in which we only see what we want to. Right. But what Taro is saying is that that is an incomplete existence. Yes, yes. Right? That's going to be a big part of, it is. of what we talk about in this game. I'm going to come back to this quote a little bit later. Yeah. Um, but that's also part of why finding meaning is so hard. Yes. Because you can say, oh, just... Just find it within yourself. Yes. But it's like, yeah, but but when we just do everything ourselves, it feels incomplete. Yeah. So it needs to be bigger than just ourselves, yeah. right? So but that's but that's what makes it so difficult. Yeah. Right. I guess I also missed on the the more obvious of all the examples there, which is which religion. One? Oh, of course. Our yeah. religion That's versus clearly. their religion. Yes. You know, yeah. our culture versus their culture. Uh, another yeah. Who, way in who's which right. that manifested. Who is correct? Who yeah. is right? Yeah. Which team is going to win? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And crusades or, or whatever it might be, right? Um, so... Uh, anyways, that's just going to be something to, to keep your keep your eye on as we're mm -hmm. playing this too. Um, there's also something they, they said was a theme in the game called 
Agaku. And this was interesting yes, because I Saito specifically said this, not so much Taro. Mm. So this is more of the producer kind of going in this direction with theme for the game. Well, yeah, because Taro doesn't want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. um, but this word is, uh, it's Japanese, obviously, but it yeah. means to struggle desperately to struggle. and fight your way out of a situation. Yeah. So, and um, what is the situation? Life. Life <laughs> Like, or, or just... <laughs> Uh, the the pit of despair in um, you know not being able to fully comprehend or find uh, an ultimate meaning or something like that yeah right and then agaku is being able to somehow make it through that yeah so did you see this Coca Cola ad that I he didn't says see inspired him I heard him talk about it I didn't I'm gonna see play it, it real quick because okay, I think it's important to have seen it okay. I don't know if we'll be able to I guess this oh is this we one. may not be able show to show it. it necessarily but okay, we can at least yeah. point people in the right direction give them a link in the description or something like that that that's going to come into play at the end <laughs> yes that coca-cola yeah. ad was a huge inspiration um for near automata specifically and like you're mm. saying it's going to come in it's going to really tie it into the ending of the game um yeah. but this is not like far off from again a, a recurring theme across yokotaro's games which is before it was the 911 stuff that we had yeah. just talked about. Now it's he saw this commercial where I guess I'll describe it um, in case somebody has not <laughs> clicked on the link in the description and gone seen this wonderful right. commercial yet that Coca Cola did. Um, I choose not to be cynical about the fact that a corporation like Coca Cola did this <laughs> and read too much into it. It'd be too easy. The, the, the sentiment is good enough for me. I like it. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> when, even when, yeah, when, when people do things you like, don't, don't. Um, get mad at them for it. Yeah, we got to Yeah, part of what we're talking about, right? <laughs> this is all related. Yeah. So, the, anyways, they they installed Coca Cola machines in Pakistan and India. Mm. These countries that are very much at odds with yes. each other have a very a complicated time. history. Yeah. Um, not a lot of good feelings between them. Uh, a lot of propaganda about one side or the other. Yes. Flying and around. and a lot of it does um, come down to religion. Being Pakistan yes. being a Muslim country. Exactly. India being Hindu. Right. So they installed these Coca-Cola machines with screens on them that are linked to the machines in the other country. And it says, make a friend in India if you're in Pakistan or make a friend in Pakistan if you're an Indian. Mm -hmm. And you actually see them and you do these little games where you're kind of like, yeah. you know, touching, the, the, doing the touch screen. Yeah, but it seemed like they kind of had to work together too. Yeah. Like both of you draw at the same time, draw a circle. Right. Yeah. And, and the, the, the purpose of the exercise is to realize to, is to come out of what Yoko Taro said here. Come on, where is my, there we go. Um, a world in which you can only see what you want to see is incomplete. Mm -hmm. If all I want to see is, well, I guess if I'm to relate it to my own country, because I don't know talk show personalities in Pakistan and <laughs> India. But if I'm only going to listen to, you know, the one of the, yeah. one of the talk show political personalities of my side. Right. And that's the only one I'm going to listen to. And that's all, you know, I'm locked in my echo chamber. There. Because it's a reflection of yourself. Yes. Right. He right. tells you what you want to hear. Yes. Which means you're just hearing yourself. You know, it's just like a mirror. If you're doing this. Yeah. You're living an incomplete life. Yes. So the idea an is echo chamber. get out of that, get out of that box in your lock in that chamber and, and go and touch hands yes. and, and actually meet people right. who think differently than you. Know, you. That's getting harder and harder as technology gets better, I know. unfortunately. <laughs> it's uh, harder and harder to actually meet people. I know. I mean, you can meet people online, but I don't know. There's something different about that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's literally so important, though. Yeah. Because you start to build this concept in your mind of what these people are. And it's yeah. told to you. And yeah. so you're, you're sitting there going, okay. But the vast majority of these people who have become enemies in your, your enemy in your mind are just normal like you. They're just living a life. They've got a family. They've got hobbies. They're just like doing cool stuff or watching anime or whatever it is yeah. that they're doing, right? And, you know, they're just trying to be happy in the way that they think that they can in, in the mm -hmm. in the worldview that they've sort of in the right. same way that you have you've you've gone yes. this path and they're, they're in the same situation locked in their echo chamber doing that but if we can step out of it and we can actually link up and actually talk as human beings you're going to find there's way more similarities 
then there are differences. Mm. And, and oh, it's, that's it's, true. It's yeah. Because all they do is scream at you the differences all day. Yeah. And so you start to only see the differences. Yeah, yeah. But those differences really don't matter that much. Mm. Because for whatever differences your religions have in terms of what you believe, a lot of times the core principles are shared across all of them. Very similar. It, yes. It's it's golden rule. It's treat your neighbor as yes, yourself. Yeah. It's it, all very similar core tenets right. that are then sort of, you know, co-opted and used against you to then uh, for the people in the power up here that want to expand their power. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, that's what they're really trying to do is use the differences to try to expand their power. Sure. So don't let them do that. <laughs> it's kind of the point, right? Like go out there and actually meet these people and you'll, you'll find out that they're actually really similar to you. I feel like this is something that I have believed that I knew for a long time, but it wasn't until recently when I've been doing a lot of traveling around oh, the world, around the world yeah. that I've actually started talking. I can't talk to a lot of people because I don't know their language, gotta, gotta but we're broken back and forth in what we know of each other's language. Yeah. It has been fascinating and just so eye-opening. I, I can't mm. recommend traveling enough to people mm. who have not done it. Yeah. Like, to just go see what it's really like in these places that are you're told are dangerous. Right. You know, oh, don't go there. Like, you know, the, the gangs have totally taken over. It's a, it's a, it's a hellhole. It's awful. It's mm. a garbage place to live. You'll, you'll read these kinds of things. Maybe, you know, maybe don't go there at 2 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> of, of course. Of course, but, but it's important But that's true of where you take, live, too. I, that's my right? point. Yeah, that yeah. was what I realized. Yeah. It is just as dangerous for me to go walking around the streets of L.A. Exactly. at 3 a.m., which then, I have done, by the way. Oh, shoot. I, I was in L.A., I think, for E3 2017, the year after oh, we went. Right. Oh, okay, okay. And it was the year that the, the Aliens Covenant film came out. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I wanted to go see it. And yeah. we were busy doing whatever. And so I went mm. to a late showing at like 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock or something like that. Didn't get out of the movie till after midnight. Yeah, yeah. And I'm walking through streets of LA. That's, it's the same, dude. <laughs> it's the same. Like, it's the same all over the world. And yeah. nobody came up to me. Nobody attacked mm. me. Nobody, I didn't feel like I was in danger. I just, it was just the thought that, oh, I probably shouldn't have done that. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But, but. Uh, there's, but. there's actually a channel I recently found. This is such a tangent. Holy fetch. <laughs> but there's this channel I recently found. I, I, I can't remember his name. Uh, uh, let's see if I can find it real quick because. Not that I need to point people to him because he's like got millions of subscribers or whatever. But this is what he does in his videos. He goes to Engineer places people. that are supposed to be the I've most dangerous of, cities or the think. most dangerous uh, hoods of yeah. these cities oh, in yeah. Brazil or, or uh, uh, Colombia <laughs> or mm. wherever. He it just should. goes there and walks through with his phone. And people and the people of the, 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 the neighborhood are like, don't do this. Put your phone away. Like, they're going to rob you. Yeah. Like, the people there are trying to help him. Yeah. Hey, right? That's, that's cool. That's the point. Is that's like, cool. That's the point. He, and nothing ever happens to him. Yeah. He's always fine. <laughs> because these things are overblown. It, it's part yeah, yeah. of the propaganda machine to turn you against each other. You right? know, pe people, uh, humans, are a lot more susceptible to uh, danger and yeah. to things like that or to being told. Because it's like, what's the risk, right? So your reward for going to a new place is that you might meet somebody. That's cool. Yeah. Like you're going to make a new friend, sure. maybe even a lifelong friend, right? Sure. Like a, a meaningful relationship. Yeah. Maybe even a future spouse. But that still isn't quite as good as the potential bad that can come, <laughs> which is you die. We, we focus on the I might <laughs> yes. die part so more like, than we do the lifelong Exactly, part. exactly. Now, even if they're the similar odds, it's like, yeah, but one is a lot worse. and Or even if there's even like a point zero 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 one percent yeah. chance you might die, you still got to weigh that against the potential benefits, and that's like infinite bad yeah. versus something that's like pretty good or really good. <laughs> or really good. But it's not infinitely good. Yeah. But it could be infinitely bad. <laughs> Anyways, so humans have a hard time calculating the risk-reward stuff, and it's more comfortable to just kind of stay at home in your house. Yeah. I, I met a guy on a train, a uh, subway train in Thailand, yeah. who I still am talking to once in a while. On. I, I still talk to the people I met in Japan. Yeah. yeah. Like uh, on, on WhatsApp. It's just like, you yeah, know, like, cool. hey, man, like he'll just send me pictures because he travels a lot. He's like, I'm oh, here now, cool. and I'm doing this. I'm like, that's <laughs> sick, dude. That's awesome. So, like, you know, it, it's, I guess my point is, yeah. like, Actually going out there and traveling has really hit, made this hit home in a way that I don't think is possible otherwise. Mm. Um, but that's a big thing. It's a big thing that's going to be focused on in the game. So, you know, another thing to keep in mind. Um, okay. 
So I wrote here on the idea of using Android characters to explore what it means to be human. Hmm. So, you know, this, this was something that... This is interesting. How do you tell a story, hmm. which are inherently meant to be human? It's why we do it. We share yes. stories because yeah, yeah. we're talking about something that matters to us as human beings. Yes. Right? Concepts, mm -hmm. themes, stories that, like, are cautionary or whatever. It's meant to help us learn vicariously by sharing each sure. other's experiences through this sort of medium of fiction yeah. that, that makes it kind of like fun, you know, a fun exercise. But the, the point is always to share human emotions and experiences with each other. How yeah. do you do that in a story entirely casted with robots and androids? Right. So this is what Saito had to say about that. The characters that appear in the game are androids. They're mechanical life forms. Uh, at first glance, when you hear that, you would imagine characters or beings with no emotion. Right. But there's going to be a lot of interaction between the characters, like 2B and 9S. And they do have some kind of dialogue between them. We see that there's some kind of emotion. And so, the image that you have of androids and mechanical life forms may change as you play the game. You would notice that they do have some kind of emotion. Um, so, I don't think that quote even really necessarily does justice to the way that this game accomplishes this. Yeah. But that's another thing that this game is going to be talking about or sort of exploring is what it means to be human. Yeah. And doing that through a science fiction lens of robotic life forms is really interesting right. because they yeah. don't know yeah. even the first thing about what it means. So right. we're getting at the real core of what it means to be human, like the very basic level. Yeah. What does it mean? Uh, that's what androids are thinking about, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, that's kind of a cool thing that it'll go over. Oh, uh, he says a little bit more about Agaku here too. While there is that theme of Agaku, I also think that there's a theme of love in this game, which you would normally not associate with robots. You will see that there's a certain type of love between the androids and the other robots themselves as well. So love is definitely like a big part of this. And how can a robot or a synthetic life form feel love? Right. What does it mean to love? And yeah, that one's that one's hard question. We'll talk about that. <laughs> we'll talk more about that later. But yeah. that that's crazy. Yeah. Because it's like. Do they even, if they have been programmed to respond a certain way, how do you know what they're feeling? And does yeah. it matter whether they feel it or not if they're responding in yeah. uh, a certain manner? Yeah. What is life? I, I mean, is that's right. kind of like the central question of a lot of great sci-fi is like, and, and that's why I love the exploration through something mechanical or robotic, right? It's like we don't associate that with life. Right. But no, what no. really is life? We are machines. Well, I've, I've heard just it. Just with these organic fleshy yes. parts. <laughs> but we are, electricity is what like runs our bodies, you know? So. I feel like one of the things that keeps us from seeing the earth as alive is just time. Yeah. Right? So if you were able to see earth at a time lapse that could <laughs> record it for 4 billion years and <laughs> condense that into like five minutes, you would see something that is constantly moving in and flux and that out of which life grows and that has these streams almost like, like blood vessels. It's got these almost like organs. It's got this almost like will to it yeah. that seems, and it, and it moves in a certain way according to the laws of gravity or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that it has these like cells that kind of move around it that kind of you know, move matter from one place to another, and mm. then it expels gas and takes in other stuff from the form of comets. Anyways, yeah. if you were able to see Earth or even the universe it, at a quicker scale, you would maybe have some thoughts of like, oh, that actually kind of looks like a living thing. Yeah. Instead of because the scale is so slow, we're just like, oh, it, do it doesn't move. It's nothing. It's not alive. Right. Right. So, yeah. There's that. Crazy. I've been thinking about that a lot lately. <laughs> yeah. Well, isn't it like. I think I remembered reading this once that like the, the tectonic plates move like mm. a certain number of like almost, almost an inch. Yeah. Like every year I've or something I've heard it like, like the rate your fingernail grows. It's like crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's fetching insane. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> a continent. But, a whole fetching continent yeah. moving. But I mean, if you in had, my life if you have a time you know, lapse. How many freaking fingernails <laughs> I've had in my lifetime. <laughs> like that's how far the fetching, my, my continent right. has shifted. And that's how much smaller the Pacific Ocean has gotten. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah really crazy and that's not even like on the scale you're talking about we're talking about 35 years versus 4 billion this billions like, like yeah. in, uh, you can't even comp comprehend that number yeah not really okay another this is a different interview interviewer asks is there any kind of message you uh, you use games for that you want to convey to your audience or anything you want them to hear from you or do you prefer to let them take whatever interpretation they get from your games back to Yoko Taro it's the latter 
I would want mm -hmm. our players to freely interpret what I've created just on their own, to grasp something f uh, for their own. I feel that's one of the interesting aspects of video games, is that you are able to freely interpret what's being shown to you. I also feel like the player uh, players make the game whole by playing it. The action of playing the game, I feel, has meaning in itself. And because of oh, that, good. I want the players to find something from the game, feel something from the game for themselves. That's really good. Pretty cool. Huh? <clears throat> the game, the game itself has no meaning. Yes. Until, Until a you player play comes and imbues it with meaning in kind of like a romantic relationship. <laughs> like you have to consummate <laughs> the game in order to extract out, like in order for it to be what it truly is. The, the, the game itself needs to be like consummated. Otherwise it's not. Oh, that's yeah. crazy. That's um, fascinating. They go on to ask here, do you feel like that cycle of violence and death and the consequences of that are human nature? And Yoko says, I think the reasons why we kill in video games do kind of shine a light on what's kind of broken within humanity or humans in general. Kind of went over this before, but yeah. we want peace in the world, but we also enjoy killing others in video games, like shooting guns yeah. in video games. <gasps> I think that's karma in a sense for humans the way that video games grasp the true nature of humanity, whether or not that's what they're aiming to do. So it's, in, in his view, yeah. this is really what humanity is. We love going around shooting each other killing and stuff, killing yeah. and slaying. But well, we, games we wouldn't sell otherwise. pretend if that they... we care about world peace. Yes. <laughs> right, yeah. We, we lie in our persona and then our subconscious mind, which directs our, our desires, which is something yeah. like, what am I going to spend my money on? And then a game that's marketed towards those subconscious desires that you have mm. that exploits the inner Power nature fantasies. of, the, yeah. Mm. And then you end up playing that game, which is all about killing things. And it's like, you know, the persona and the uh, inner, you know, unconscious mind, they do not line up. Yeah. I, I've come to the conclusion that humanity hates peace. Like yes, just, just very much truly so. loathes. Yeah, it. we do not want. And peace. it's not for the reasons that people might expect upon hearing that. <laughs> uh, this is actually for another point of philosophy. I guess we've been kind of chewing on back and forth on this podcast for years, which is yeah. there's nothing worse to humanity than boredom. Nothing. Right, right. Nothing right. is worse yes. than being bored. We'll do anything, yeah. anything, even inflict pain on ourselves uh, rather than be bored. Yep. This is something that yep. um, Dostoevsky. I don't know if you've seen the the YouTube original series from Vsauce, um, Minefield. I don't think so, no. It's really good. No. Um, I'm obsessed with it. I, I yeah. rewatch them all the time. I think I've seen the series probably like 17 times now. <laughs> mm. There's three seasons. They're about 30 minutes per episode, 10 episodes per season. Oh, cool. But there's one uh, episode where uh, the experiment that they set up, they, they bring the, the subjects in and they show them this buzzer that gives them a shock. Oh, yeah. And so they all try it and they're like, ooh, oh, that, that was terrible. That was uncomfortable, right? Mm. And they're like, oh, man, like, yeah, be careful of that button. It like shocks you or whatever. Like, <laughs> you know, now that you've done that, what, you're never going to touch that again, are you? They're like, no way. That was horrible. Yeah. And then the next thing they do is they take them into a waiting room where they're waiting for the, the real experiment to happen. Right. But they're alone in the room. That's a smart way room. to do an experiment. Yeah. yeah. They're alone in the room. With the button. With the button. Yep, yep, yep. And they're just sitting there for like. So what percentage of people? Just, all of them. All of them? All of them no hit way. the button. That's and crazy. it wasn't even like they waited a long time. It yeah. was like a couple minutes. Wow. They couldn't be bored for a couple of minutes before they were willing to inflict pain on themselves <laughs> rather than be bored. Dude, we are so screwed, <laughs> man. We are so screwed. This, this oh is gosh. exactly what he's talking about, I feel like. There is no. nothing worse than being bored. So peace is boring. Yes, when there's no yes. conflict, it's the same reason that stories yeah. need conflict. Right. If there's no conflict in a story, yeah. the story is boring. Well, the story is patterned after the way that our brain kind of um, takes in information, right? Yeah. And that's how stories have gotten to be so formulaic, yes. we'll say. And part of the way the human brain works is... Where's the conflict? Where's I the conflict? want the conflict. Give me the conflict. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know where the conflict. I want to know where the conflict's at. <laughs> and, conflict. and we are bored to death. We're bored to death until we find it. Yeah, and yeah, it's crazy. Now the reason for this, I mean, it's not entirely cynical. I mean, obviously we evolved this way, and it's sort of hardwired into our DNA. It's what makes us what we are in a yeah. certain sense. But there's it's also, also makes a us reason. very productive. Yes, yeah. it's it's what it's what causes human beings to have the motivation to grow right to go out there and do something yeah to learn to develop to build to all of this is there's a problem facing me yep. now the problem doesn't necessarily have to be 
the warring tribe next to us is <laughs> yeah. trying to kill there's me a, there's a and I want revenge. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I guess <laughs> when I say humanity hates peace, like uh, the caveat, obviously, with that is there are still problems outside of war and death and, sure. yeah. and, and conflict in that sense that could, yeah. you know, spark humanity's uh, need to grow without killing. So I, I, I acknowledge this and I, I make that caveat. Well, my, my, my real point That's is good. if there's no conflict, we're going to find a way to create it. Yep. Um, it, it, because there's nothing worse than just having nothing to do, feeling like there's nothing to strive for, there's nothing to work on, Gosh. there's no problem to solve. Yeah. Without a problem to solve, uh, life has no purpose, and life having no purpose is literally damnation. Yeah. In, in the sense of like a damn stopping yeah, progress. That right? things don't go forward. Like, if, if that's not happening, like, the, life is hell. There's nothing yeah. worse than that. There has Dying to be would be better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a, like an eternal uh, progression, sure, or an eternal becoming, right? right? That that you you know never quite achieve what you are. You are always becoming something. Yeah. Um, there's a something William Blake said um, was that uh, there must be suffering in heaven, right? Yeah. Otherwise, like nothing. Not only yeah. nothing would happen, but um, you can't have joy without yeah, suffering. Without it. Right. Yeah. And so his conclusion was that there must be suffering in heaven. And it's like, that's a, uh, that's an interest. That's not the typical conception that's of not what they tell for you. most people, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, well, I don't know. We'll but see. is heaven really we'll heaven? If it's boring. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Right. I don't think so. <laughs> well, and that's what Dostoevsky says. If, if humans ever achieved utopia, the first thing that they would do is break it just so that something interesting would happen. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was in uh, notes from the underground. Yeah. Right? Underground. Yeah. 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 Uh, kind of a, I guess, rep a response to Marx with uh, yeah. the, the, the whole idea the of utopia. Concept, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ooh, so this game's going to be fun, dude. <laughs> I, it's going to be great. I'm actually really excited to revisit it. <laughs> Me too. It. It's been a long time. Well, I'm remembering my first experience with Nier too, and I'm just yeah. like, ah, oh, the first so, Nier was so good. It was so it's meaningful. So it was such yeah. a meaningful experience for Fantastic. me. It was such a good game. So I got another quote from Taro here. Certainly the first game was very emotional. It was a very wet kind of story. I kind of like to hear this analogy, a yeah, wet, wet story. What I'm trying to do here in this game, Automata, is much more dry approach. Looking at the themes of the unfairness of the world and the harsh prejudiced realities that the characters are facing. But in a, in a so I, I like that as um, a sort of analogy for the type of emotionality. Mm. Like near replicant gestalt is, is, is a wet emotion. It's, oh, yes. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's an emotion dry. that it like soaks you and weighs you down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this game is drier and, and that, that mm. works because it's androids and yeah, robots. Yeah, that's right, that's right. That are all the characters we see here. Maybe things that are having trouble feeling expressing themselves emotion. and feeling things, yeah. And, and they're sort of exploring yeah. that or trying to understand what that even means. Right. And so there's, there's almost this like, I guess in the first game, maybe a good way to put it is um, this sort of maybe... How do I put this? I'm, I'm trying to think of like uh, the right way to articulate this idea in my mind, like almost like the different halves of your brain, oh, yeah. right? Like there's there's like an intuitive side, a yeah, um, the 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 okay, I, I know what we can do. We can we can use the the um. <laughs> my brain is not working at all. The, the freaking symbol, the, the, the oh yin yang, the yes, yes the, yeah, the, the thank Dao, you, the Dao, yeah, holy yeah. fetch. <laughs> There's a yin, yin and yang aspect to this, yeah. where uh, I would say that Nier Automata's like expression of emotion is very yin. It's very like on the side of the feminine. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, if you haven't seen our Nier Automata or Xenogears series, when we're referring to feminine, masculine, we're not referring to gender. Oh, like boy, girl. N yes. No, no. It, we're not yeah, saying man, woman. Masculine, not, feminine doesn't there's, mean. There's, there's a whole. Yeah. Freaking segment we did on that where we yeah. talk about gender on a spectrum <laughs> and all this other thing So that's not what we mean. What we mean is just simply the the split between feminine and masculine qualities and people Identify with both sides to a certain degree and yeah, may yeah. lean more one way or another. Yeah, but the feminine in the yin uh, you know the, the yang the, the the male side is very strictly logical and, and, and about order. Yeah, yeah um, Emperor Gestal Versus Kefka, yeah, yeah, who is yeah. the yin, yes, Gestalt, yes. who is the yang to each other, right? So 
this is more Yang in terms of the way it approaches mm. almost like a, in, in a logical way. Right. Like a computer. Yeah. yeah. Like analyzing like emotion. Mm. So, um, it's different, but it's got the same intensity, I would mm. say. Same intensity of emotion expressed through sort of an opposite uh, side of the spectrum. Hmm. You know, cool. thinking of wet and dry also, wet would be associated with the yin yeah. and dry yeah. with the yang. Exactly. Right? So, it's a yeah. similar kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So, there's that. Um, here's another quote. All the time I spent on the original getting angry at the development team, Platinum's removed that by working so well. <laughs> I, I liked that <laughs> quote because Platinum is a very established developer. Yeah. They have a very polished uh, you know, history, I guess, of the games they release. And so a lot of his worry as uh, the creative director of the game yeah. was getting these young devs who didn't have that sort of experience to make a game that actually works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so like his work on this wasn't necessarily so much burned on that side. It was a lot more being able to focus on the story and developing yeah. that sort of side of it. And Platinum, they could That's handle good. the gameplay, you know? Oh, he was talking about how good the developers were uh, to yeah. work with. Um, he was saying something like, uh, like it was so fun for him to direct this game because often the um, people making the game would present to him scenarios and say, oh, we here's some options, right? They mm -hmm. actually would think through this stuff uh, on their own and say, hey, we could do this or that. And then Yoko Taro just needs to pick one. Like, yep. oh, let's do that one. Yep. And th the way he put it was like the game almost just made itself, yep. right? R just in front of me, <laughs> which, is, which is so good. Yeah, I like that because then he gets to focus more on the part that he yeah. is really good at. Exactly, right? yes. Um, He's very complimentary of Platinum Games. Yeah. He really, I think he really liked working with them. Yeah, and so like Taro, the guy I brought up earlier who was the fan of Nier who was at Platinum Games. Oh, Taro, to oh, you mean Tao, um, sorry, Tao. Um, what was his name? Tao, um, I got it at the top. Takahisa, Takahisa Taura, that's Taura. Okay, Taura. Um, he kind of handled a lot of that side of things. Uh, mm. And so they, they, they worked together in that capacity. And I, I think that's I think that's a testament to why um, to why Nier Automata had the amazing success that it had versus the first Nier. Yeah. First Nier had like all the elements there, but it just didn't get off the ground because it's a game, and the gameplay just yes. was not polished. Yeah, as Shigeru Miyamoto would have said, <laughs> yeah. you've got to focus on gameplay first if you're making a game. Here, it was. And yeah. so, like, playing the game is just a smooth experience. It's yeah. really, really great. Almost no matter it what platform really you play it on now. I mean, even the Switch port is, like, uh, yeah. almost miraculously competent. Well, they call it a miracle <laughs> port, right? Yeah. They say that they get 30 FPS, and I know that's not 60, but for the Switch, for yeah. this game to play at 30... And, and like no frame drops, like yeah. a solid 30. That's kind of a it's, miracle. It's really impressive. Very good. And so like when there's no hiccups on that side of things and you can really just like get invested in it and, you know, sucked into that world, like then Taro can grab you, right? Yeah. And he can like pull you in and, and sort of like show you this stuff that goes on in his <laughs> Emil Dome. <laughs> his Emil Dome. <laughs> That's good. Um, so it, it ended up just really working. The collaboration was perfect for both sides. Yeah. It was exactly what both sides, it's what Nier needed from Platinum and what Platinum needed as far as like a game of this sort of ambition thematically. You know, that yeah. kind of goes beyond, and I'm not, I'm, try, I'm not trying to rag on Bayonetta or something, but I just, <laughs> Bayonetta is not the same I never thing actually play as Nier, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? It's not trying to be. Although some of the gameplay may look similar at times. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, Very it, different it's, it's not on, on the story level, even attempting to be the same thing. You know, I Nier think, I think be. I did equate Bayonetta with Nier Automata when it first came out. Yeah. I um, think you wouldn't. At least in part. I mean, it's a. Yeah. It's a, an, an attractive woman doing these like arcade game moves <laughs> and this crazy, you know, I don't know, some of it. And I think in Bayonetta, she has white hair too, right? Mm -hmm. Anyways, there are some similarities that made me kind of conflate the two in my mind back yeah. when they came out. I hadn't played either at the time. Um, there's one other thing he mentions here, and I, I just want to say this just to kind of, again, sort of uh, have a good time. I don't know how to put this. I, I just like Yoko Taro. I like his personality. Yeah. I yeah. like his way of thinking because it's he's so different from mine. Yeah, yeah. And he's just got this quirkiness to him that I think is just so fun. Yep. So he says, I spend a lot of time drinking. <laughs> of course. Of course he does. In the end, it really hasn't changed how much I or how much work I do. But when I drink, I make better games, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> see, is he, is he being serious? I just don't know. That's a good question. My doctor wasn't very happy about the condition of my liver, 
but I'm still drinking a lot. I might drop dead at any minute. But um, no, he was really late. And this was uh, on a lot of deadlines. So this was actually, the oh, game was, right. was they were considering yeah. canceling it early mm, on because he was away. five months late with delivering the story. Just with the story. Yeah, just the story. And yeah. I've heard there were a few other elements yeah. that he was a few months late on as well. And he drinks a lot mm-hmm. and he doesn't like coming into work in the morning. No, he doesn't. <laughs> so th- this was another trouble with Platinum Games. First off, he lived in Tokyo. Yes. And Platinum's in Osaka, uh, right? Osaka, so it's like, yeah. okay, you've got to like... Come down here. Now, Square Enix is is in Tokyo. Yeah. But he had to kind of move to Osaka, basically. But then also his freelance schedule, yep. it didn't work with Platinum nope. Games. Basically, what they had to do is they had to create this like window of time where Yoko Taro might be there. He won't be anywhere outside the window. But within this window, <laughs> he might be there. And so plan all of your meetings within this Around window. That. And if he's there, he's there. If he's not, he's not. Yep. But this is so funny because any of you who think you can pull this off, <laughs> Yoko Taro can pull this off because he's Yoko Taro. Yeah. Right? And this is also why he hasn't had to get hired by any of these. He can stay a freelance um, mm-hmm. artist. Right. He hasn't had to get hired by a specific company, um, you know, golden handcuffs kind of thing. Yeah. He does what he freaking wants. And if you want him to make a game for your company, yep. then you deal with you it. Gotta work you him. deal with it. Yep. Like there, you don't fire this guy. Like yep. he's a visionary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's great though. And, and like you said, a lot of times it is kind of hard to tell, like, is he being serious? Or oh, not? it's but, so hard. Uh, um, anyway, so the last thing I'm going to do here, and then we're going to wrap up. Cool. Um, there is actually a book specifically. I didn't copy this quote down. It's in one of the many tabs I have open that I'm not going to go through right now. <laughs> okay. Um, he mentions specifically like, oh, you know, Pascal, you know, is obviously a reference to this and right. Sacher's reference to this, Sart, 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 Sart. Is, is a reference to this guy. Mm-hmm. And so like, you know, you must read a lot of philosophy. He's like, actually, no, I don't. <laughs> I yes. don't really care about philosophy. It's like his, <laughs> his response to that. And then he says his, his character's response to it, right? Sure. That that's yeah, yeah. a good point. And yeah. and kind of what I have felt from most of these responses is is he's in character when he says these things. Obviously yeah. he cares somewhat. But um he mentions this book uh that I actually went out and bought on purpose uh in order to read some of the things I, possibly I yeah. that he read as he was in the right. toilet. Maybe, <laughs> that's yes. where he says he, he keeps he, the book. Yep. <laughs> so yep. again, there's it's almost like this jab at like ever taking himself or we shouldn't take ourselves so seriously, which yes. is what philosophers tend to do, right? Right. And so it's, it's almost his serious. way of kind of like poking fun at yeah, philosophers yeah. in general. I, I read this book that is, um, it, it's actually a, a book more or less that summarizes the philosophies of like, like two a pages. tons of different people. Yeah. Um, from the ancient world to the contemporary world. So you know, the Renaissance and the medieval world and everything in between. So it'll, it'll take all of these famous philosophers and just sort of just like very briefly summarize. You give you like a 101. So the, the book is called The Philosophy Book. The Philosophy Big book. Ideas Simply Explained. Yeah. And he says, Taro says he has this and then yeah. he keeps it in his bathroom. And then when he goes to the bathroom, he'll, he'll read it so he can feel like he understands these concepts. But I don't really get it. I don't really know. <laughs> Which is not true. No, no, it's not. <laughs> um, obviously, he's read more than what's in the philosophy book. Yes. But I wanted to read um, some of the entries for some of the people we're going to be talking about from this because they're pretty short. So Good. we can do that. But um, it'll give you a sense of maybe something he read, which I think he probably really does have this book in his bathroom. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. that might have sparked the idea to, you know, maybe right. I can think about that a little more as I'm developing right. my story, right? So um, we're going to start with Pascal. Pascal. Uh, because Pascal's wager. There's also another book called The Psychology Book. Yes. And he, I got he, that as well. He kind of references both. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've got them too. Got it. Imagination yeah. decides everything. Yeah, so Pascal was 1623 to 1662. Oh, he didn't. He was not even 40. Not even. He was like 41. 20, 23 to 62. Sorry. I no, can't 39, do that right now. 39, 39, 39. 39. Dang. 39 years old. That's as long as he lived. That sucks. Mm. Okay. So with, it, what's kind of cool about this is they'll um, they'll give you context about the branch of philosophy, oh, um, yeah. the, the, their approach, you know, so uh, people that came before and what they said that sort of led to this line of thought and then what people have said about it after or how it's oh, developed cool. after. Just really brief, you know, give you sort of some context. So this says, Pascal's best known book, Again, I cannot pronounce any French words, so I'm sorry. Like, French is just like a freaking en- enigma to me. I, I have no idea how to say these words. Pense? Pense? Pense. 
Penseis? I think it means I never know whether uh, if the S at the end I should say it or not. Oh, Pense... (laughs) You know what? I don't know either. I don't know. For that one, I don't know. Okay, so that's the name of the book. Pense is not primarily a philosophical work. Rather, it is a compilation of fragments from his notes for a projected book on Christian theology. I guess we should Mm. say about him, a lot of what he was trying to do was convince people to come back to the Catholic Church. Yes. Particularly people who might have left... Mm-hmm. Or, or, you know, they were exploring ideas outside of it. Right. His, his That's philosophy. Pascal's wager in general. Yes. He's like, if, if you're wrong, if like his say somebody leaves the Catholic faith, becomes an atheist. Yes. He says, if you're wrong, you burn in hell for eternity. Right. But if I'm wrong, you're fine. Then nothing. So, right. so just pick mine. <laughs> <laughs> because you have a lot less at, to lose. Exactly. It's a wager. It's like, what, what, are, you, what are you willing to risk yeah. that there is no God? Are you right. willing to risk eternity in hell? Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, that's so, yeah, Pascal's wager. That's who we're talking about. And um, a lot of his work can come across very cynical and yeah. that he was a cynical person. And, and he was in a way, but like there was always sort of this side to it where it was. Um, but see, this is only this isn't the case if you believe in God. <laughs> so it was like, oh, sure. This so is the world. This is the world and how cynical and awful and terrible it is. But if you believe in God, then it won't be that way. Sure, so it yeah. was his way of trying to lead people to convert. <laughs> so that was kind of like his modus operandi, I guess, of why he was, you know, doing what he's doing and writing what he's writing. Mm-hmm. So this is this book is more of a compilation and, and fragments of his notes and things for a projected book on Christian theology. His ideas were aimed primarily at what he called liber- libertines. Again, probably French, and I'm probably butchering that. Ex-Catholics who had left religion as a result of the sort of free thinking encouraged by skeptical writers. In one of the longer fragments, Pascal discusses imagination. He offers little or no argument for his claims, being concerned merely to set down his thoughts on the matter. Hmm. Pascal's point is, is that imagination is the most powerful force in human beings and one of their chief sources of error. I think that's probably true. The yeah. imagination being that powerful. Yeah. And error. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Imagination, he says, causes us to trust people despite what reason tells us. For example, because lawyers and doctors dress up in special clothes, we tend to trust them more. Conversely, we pay less attention to someone who looks shabby or odd, even if he is talking good sense. Mm. What makes things worse is that though it usually leads to falsehood, imagination occasionally leads to truth. If it were always false, then we could use it as a source of certainty by simply accepting its negation. After presenting the case against imagination in some detail, Pascal suddenly ends his discussion of it by writing, Imagination decides everything. It produces beauty, justice, and happiness, which is the greatest thing in the world. Out of context, it might seem that he is praising imagination, but we can see from what preceded this passage that his intention is very different. As imagination usually leads to error, then the beauty, justice, and happiness that it produces will usually be false. In the Mm -hmm. wider context of of, uh, a work of Christian theology, and especially in light of Pascal's emphasis on the use of reason to bring people to religious belief, we can see that his aim is to show the libertines that that the life of pleasure that they have chosen is not what they think it is. Although they believe that they have chosen the path of reason, they have in fact been misled by the power of imagination. Interesting. Huh. So that's kind of uh, a very, very brief. Again, I'm going to actually read the book. <laughs> yeah. I'm not just going to read it. No, I, I got it too. So yeah, um, that'll be fun. But like that's sort of a Kickstarter, I guess, to understanding where Pascal's mind was and how that might lead into this character, Pascal, we will mm-hmm. see in the game. Yeah. So just. Know that. That's a book you can look into if you have the time. I I know that I don't, but I'm going to try to anyways. (laughs) Uh, Read that. Um, But I think the more interesting one, probably the more important one, if you're going to choose one of these philosophy books, is the next one from uh, Psychology. Oh, the next entry. The the next, uh, sorry, uh, a book from one of these people, not like the, not these books that are. Okay. um, What do you call it? Just some compilations, yeah. Yeah. Jean Paul Sartre. Existence precedes essence. Hmm. This one is like huge for Nero Tom. <laughs> and it, it's really kind of like the basis of the existentialist oh, yeah. sort of like philosophy, right? Hmm. Since ancient times, the question of what it is to be human and what makes us so distinct from all other types of being 
has been one of the main occupations of philosophers. Their approach to the question assumes that there is such a thing as human nature, or an essence of what it is to be human. It also tends to assume that this human nature is fixed across time and space. In other words, it assumes that there is a universal essence of what it is to be human, and that this essence can be found in every single human that has ever existed, or will ever exist. According to this view, all human beings, regardless of their circumstances, possess the same fundamental qualities that are guided by the same basic values. For Sartre, however, thinking about human nature in this way risks missing what is most important about human beings, and that is our freedom. So he's going to give, I think, a pretty great analogy of what the essence of a thing is by using the, uh, the, the uh, example of a paper knife. To clarify what he means by this, Sartre gives the following illustration. He asks us to imagine a paper knife, the kind of knife that might be used to open an envelope. This knife has been made by a craftsman who has had the idea of creating such a tool and who had a clear understanding of what is required of the paper knife. It needs to be sharp enough to cut through paper, but not so sharp as to be dangerous. It needs to be easy to wield, made of an appropriate substance, metal, bamboo, or wood perhaps, but not butter, wax, or feathers, right. Right? and fashioned to function efficiently. Sartre says that it is inconceivable for a paper knife to exist without its maker knowing what it is going to be used for. Hmm. Therefore, the essence of a paper knife, or of all things, uh, all the things that uh, make it a paper knife, and not a steak knife, or a paper airplane, comes before the existence of any particular paper knife. Right. So in order for a paper knife to exist, a creator of the paper knife had to have had an idea of what it's going to be used for first. That is the essence of the thing. Yeah, the telos, like the purpose, the, the reason it exists. Yes, yeah. exactly. Humans, of course, are not paper knives. For Sartre, there is no preordained plan that makes us the kind of beings that we are. We are not made for any particular purpose. We exist not because uh, of our, pur well, hold on. We exist, but we exist, comma, but not because of our purpose or essence like a paper knife does. Our existence precedes our essence. He has a little graph here that I could maybe take a screenshot of that and send mm -hmm. it to you. So in defining ourselves, this is where we begin to see the connection between Sartre's claim that existence precedes essence and his atheism. Sartre points out that religious approaches to the question of human nature often work by means of an analogy with human craftsmanship, that human nature in the mind of God is analogous to the nature of the paper knife in the mind of the craftsman who makes it. Yeah, this is like the watch thing. The yeah, the watchmaker. Finding a watch. Yeah, watchmaker. Yeah. Um, even many non-religious uh, theories of human nature, Sartre claims, still have their roots in religious ways of thinking. This goes back to like... Plato and oh, yeah. people like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, because they continue to insist that essence comes before existence or that we are made for a specific purpose. Plato in, definitely did. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in claiming that existence comes from essence, Sartre is setting out a position that he believes is more consistent with his atheism. There is no universal fixed human nature, he declares, because no God exists who could ordain such a nature. Here, Sartre is, re is relying on a very specific definition of human nature, identifying the nature of something with its purpose. He's rejecting the concept of what philosophers call teology in human nature. Teleology, yeah. yeah. No, teleology. That, is, is, uh, that it is something that we can think about in terms of the purpose of human existence. Nevertheless, there is a sense in which Sartre is offering a theory of human nature by claiming that we are the kinds of beings who are compelled to assign a purpose to our lives, with no divine power to prescribe that purpose, we must define it ourselves. Defining ourselves, however, is not just a matter of being able to say what we are as human beings. Instead, it is a matter of shaping ourselves into whatever kind of being we choose to become. This is what makes us, at root, different from all other kinds of beings in the world. We can become whatever we choose to make ourselves. A rock is simply a rock. A cauliflower is simply a cauliflower. A mouse is simply a mouse, but human beings possess the ability to actively shape themselves. Now, of course, this comes with limits. We can't grow no, wings. So. The, uh, as hard as we try, we're not going to grow <laughs> wings and fly, right? Right. Um, but because Sartre's philosophy releases us from the constraint of, a human, of human nature that is preordained, it is also one of freedom. We are free to choose how to shape ourselves, although we do have to accept certain limitations. 
which I just described. Sartre wants us to break free of habitual ways of thinking, telling us to face up to the implications of living in a world in which nothing is preordained. To avoid falling into unconscious patterns of behavior, he believes we must continually face up and ch uh, make choices about how to act. So, uh, I skipped over this part, but no amount of willing ourselves will, to grow wings, for example, will cause that to happen. But even within the range of realistic choices we have, we often find that we are constrained and simply make decisions based on habit or because of the way in which we have become accustomed to seeing ourselves. So, yes, I'm going to stop there and not move on to uh, what's the others. Uh, De Beauvoir. De Beauvoir. Yeah, I'm not going to move on to her because um, I don't think it's essential at this point. We'll talk about her later. But those are some of the things to chew on and some of the things to think about, um, and some of the things to possibly read if you want to do that. Uh, to, to like get a deeper understanding kind of what Nier is driving at here, Nier Automata. But that's all we're going to do for this week. Very interesting. That's, yep. all, that's all we're doing for now. We hope you enjoyed our first episode of this. We're looking forward to seeing your comments and uh, what you will add to the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Drake Chandler is saying, Jean-Paul Sartre is the only philosopher who had his name censored from the game. Oh, so that's it right. Like they that's tried right. to use Sartre. But so yes, the I read this. Name was Jean Paul, not Sartre. Right, right. and yeah. the reason was because the Sartre estate is yes. notoriously difficult to work with in terms of licensing the name, right. the use of the name, and <laughs> and apparently they're he, not too nice. He had to the him funniest quote about this. Taru did, where he's like, yeah. "If it had turned out that I had not been able to use the the Jean Paul part of it, I yeah. would have just what did he say? He would have called him instead." Something really like derogatory or mean. <laughs> I, I wish I had copied it down. The oh. copyright pig. The copyright pig. <laughs> I, 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 I just grabbed it too. You just got the same article. I'm not okay. saying that all this came out of the Sart estate. It's just that Square Enix told me it's probably dangerous. Yoko laughed. Ah. I was so annoyed that I couldn't use the name. And so if Jean Paul didn't go through, I was just going to call him the copyright pig. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to name the character in the game the copyright pig. And we were all supposed to know that this was a reference to <laughs> Jean-Paul Sartre. <laughs> anyway. That's great. Leaving off on that note, uh, we hope to see you guys again next week. Thank you for joining us. And again, play through ending A, even though we won't probably get that far in what we talk about. See you next week. Peace out. <laughs>